the millionaire fast lane. Part 6. Your vehicle to wealth, you. Fast lane 22. Own yourself first. Events and circumstances have their origin in ourselves. They spring from seeds which we have sown. Henry David Thoreau. The paralysis of, pay yourself first. Fast lane success demands a well-tuned vehicle primed and prepared for the jour, nay that awaits. You are the vehicle to wealth. You are mechanism for movement. You are responsible for making the journey and the first step in taking charge of. You, is to own you. Surely you've heard, pay yourself first, a common slow lane declaration born. From the classic 1926 book, The Richest Man in Babylon by George Classen. A good read, but fundamentally flawed. If you aren't familiar with, pay yourself first, it's a slow lane doctrine that urges you to save your money, pay yourself, before all else, food, gas, car payments, and other bills. This supposedly forces the slow laner's savings rate to accelerate their putrid wealth acceleration vehicle, compound interest via market investments. The fact is, advising a slow laner to pay yourself first is like advising a quad replegic to climb a flight of stairs. It's futilely fruitless. If you have a job, examine your last paycheck. Is your gross pay that same as your net pay? It isn't and for some, it may be as much as 35% less. Additionally, pre-tax saving weapons such as 401ks and IRA severely limit your contributions to infantile amounts where creating wealth on a pre-tax basis in a job becomes organizationally penal. If your primary income source comes from a job, your ability to pay yourself first is paralyzed because the governments are paid first. 4. Pay yourself first. To be legitimate, you truly need to pay yourself first in infinite amounts and the government last. You must own your vehicle. To pay yourself first, you must own yourself. You can't pay yourself first if you don't own yourself. Your vehicle, you, must be free and clear. When you have a job, someone owns you. And when someone owns you, you aren't paid first, but last. The first step to controlling your vehicle, you, is to own yourself so you can truly pay yourself first and the government last. That is accomplished by shelling your business into a corporation that you control. The corporation serves as the fast lane frame because it offers the immediate tax benefit of pay yourself first versus pay yourself last. When you own a COR poration, net profits are reduced by expenses. The remaining profit is taxed, and those taxes are paid to the government. Additionally, corporations exist separate from their owners and survive time. It's the surrogate structure that serves as your business system. When you own a corporation, the government is paid four times a year, once every quarter through estimated taxes. If you have a payroll, taxes are paid each time you pay your employees. I pay myself first 365 times a year while the government is paid four times a year. Doesn't that sound like a structure that is conducive to not only pay yourself first but also wealth? How to own yourself? Like many entrepreneurs, I made the horrific mistake of getting into business as a sole proprietor. Any advisor who recommends a business structure as a sole proprietorship or general partnership should be avoided like an airport toilet. These entities are risky because they don't protect you and catapult unlimited liability onto you and your personal assets. If you're a plumber organized as a sole proprietor and you accidentally leave a pipe cutter at a client's house and the client's three-year-old kills himself with it, guess what? They're coming after you because you chose an ill-protected business entity. Instead of suing a corporation, they sue you and everything you own is up for grabs. The best business structures for your fast lane business are 1. C Corporation 2. S Corporation 3. Limited Liability Corporation Each has its advantages and disadvantages, but all share two common benefits. Limitation of Liability and Tax Efficiency the C Corporation. The C Corporation is a business structure that survives time and can be easily transferred. Corporate profits are taxed at corporate income tax rates, with net income distributed to shareholders. Some C Corp owners use this structure to deploy a strategy known as income splitting. The strategy is to partition the business's income to both the owner and the business, effectively lowering the tax bracket of the two, versus a large income for just one. 
While it's not within the scope of this book to dive into tax strategy and corporate formation, it does offer up a fast lane component, which is control. While C corporations and their owners are subject to double taxation, tax on corporate profits and dividends to shareholders, they are advantageous for larger corporations and corporations with an asset growth strategy. In other words, if you don't plan on distributing profits and are focused on building asset value over net profit, C corporations do the job. The majority of publicly traded com companies are C core that do not distribute dividends to their shareholders. They grow revenue and asset value. The S corporation. An S corporation is like a C corporation except that it isn't taxed as a separate entity. Considered a pass-through entity, taxes aren't paid at the corporate level, but at the individual level and reflected on the owner's personal tax return. S corpora tie-ins also have some tax advantages because profits are not subject to the hefty self-employment tax that comes with sole proprietorships. However, unlike C corporations, which can have limitless owners, S corporations are limited to 100 owners and will have additional filing requirements. The Limited Liability Corp, LLC An LLC operates just like a corporation with the benefits of a partnership or a sole proprietorship. LLC profit passes through to its owners, called members, and is reflected on their personal income tax. LLCs are also considered pass-through entities because profit passes directly to the owners. For partnerships, the LLC or the S-Corp is the recommended structure in lieu of a general partnership, which, again, does not offer liability protection. For small startups, I recommend either an LLC or an S-Corp stay away from partnerships and sole proprietorships, as they do not limit liability. Creating a corporation is not as daunting as it seems. Depending on your state, it shouldn't cost more than $1,000. In Arizona, one can be created for less than a few hundred dollars. Selecting an entity. Selecting an entity depends on your goals and your vision for your business. Here are some general questions to help you decide. What is your exit strategy? Go public. Sell to private investors. What is your growth strategy? What is your liability exposure in the worst case? Do you plan on raising capital now or in the future? Do you plan to hire employees? Do you plan to take on new partners? Do you plan on earning profits fast? Or not for a while? Your answers will determine the best entity for you. In my businesses, I use both an S-Corp and an LLC. And finally, I'm not an accountant or an attorney and this should not be construed as professional advice, so please, consult with someone who has the appropriate credentials to verify or disprove what I recommend. Chapter Summary, Fast Lane Distinctions Pay yourself first is fundamentally impossible in a job. To own your vehicle, you start a corporation that formally divorces you from. The Act of Business Your corporation is the body of your surrogate. The recommended fast lane business entity is a C Corp, an S Corp, or an LLC. Fast Lane 23. Life Steering Wheel. Your life is the sum result of all the choices you make, both consciously and unconsciously. If you can control the process of choosing, you can take control of all aspects of your life. You can find the freedom that comes from being in charge of yourself. Robert F. Bennett. The leading cause of poorness. If poorness were an illness, take a guess as to its cause. Of course, lack of money. But is that a cause or a symptom of the underlying problem? Lack of education. Lack of opportunity, positive role models, or determination. Nope. Those are all symptoms. If you retrace poverty's footprints you will find that poorness starts at the exact same place, choice. Poor choices are the leading cause of poorness. The heart of the problem is my income elevated, so did my cholesterol. The road of good living runs parallel to a cliff of gluttony. My doctor's preferred method of attack was prescription drugs. I refused because I wanted to fix problems, not mask symptoms. If you approach wealth like a big pharmaceutical company and attack symptoms while neglecting problems, you will not succeed. Feeling tired? Take this pill. Want to lose weight? Another pill. The problems are ignored while the symptoms are addressed in catatonic cycles. I refused cholesterol medication because it addressed the symptom, not the problem. 
the problem is poor diet, cholesterol is the symptom. If your car's fuel tank had a small leak, how would you fix it? The symptomatic solver would increase his trips to the gas station to ensure a steady inflow of fuel. The problematic solver plugs up the hole. One addresses the symptom, the gas tank leaks, while the other addresses the problem, there's a hole in the gas tank. While adding fuel addresses the symptom, it doesn't solve the problem. When the behavior stops the problem remains. How does this relate to success and choices? Simple, if you aren't where you want to be, the problem is your choices. Your circumstances are the symptoms of those choices. For example, everyone loves success quotes. Here are two. The will to persevere is often the difference between failure and success. Success means having the courage, the determination, and the will to become. The person you believe you were meant to be. The problem with these quotes is they're asymptomatic. They're ambiguous to the real issue, and that is choice. The first quote deals with perseverance. How do you persevere? You react from conscious choice. Not just one choice but hun, dreads, perhaps thousands. You cannot choose to persevere with one choice. You cannot wake up one day and say, oh, today I will choose to persevere. It must happen every day, not just once. Perseverance is architected by many choices that fabricate lifestyle. If you quit after two tries, have you persevered? Can you claim perseverance after one failure? Likewise, the second quote suffers from the same conundrum. Determination is not a solitary choice but thousands of them. You cannot decide to be determined, it must occur repeatedly, concertedly, and with commitment. The point of this dissertation is that fast lane success isn't one choice. It's hundreds. And when you line a string of choices together, they create your pro-cess, and your process will create your lifestyle. Lifestyle choices will make you a millionaire. Your life's steering wheel. Your choices spark the fires of future circumstances. The fabric of your life is sown by the cumulative consequences of your choices, millions of them, that you set into motion. You act, react, believe, disbelieve, perceive, misperceive, and all of it engineers your existence. If you're dissatisfied with life, your choices take full responsibility. Blame yourself and the choices you've made. Yes, you are as you have chosen. It took me 26 years of life and a blizzard to grasp the horsepower of my choices. The blizzard impeded my limousine, but I was there because I chose it. I chose to get the job. I chose to pursue low-rent businesses. I chose to continue life in Chicago. I chose to avoid corporate after college. I chose my friends. I chose my business pursuits. I chose all of it, and it engineered my life to that exact moment. I awoke to the epiphany that I was the driver of my life and my problems were the consequences of my choices. I steered myself there. Wherever you are, reading on the train, on a plane, on the toilet in a rundown apartment, or on a beach in the Caribbean, you've chosen. I didn't force you to pick up this book and read it. You chose to. Yes, you are exactly where you decide to be. And if that's unhappiness, you need to start making better choices. Choose to be wealthy or choose to be poor. There's a big chasm between thinking wealth and choosing wealth. You can choose the sidewalk, the slow lane, or the fast lane. You can choose to align your life with greater purpose, or choose to let life live you. You can choose to believe these theories or choose not to. The common denominator is you. Your steering wheel, choice, is the most powerful control you have in your life. Why do I hate the slow lane? Because it denies choice and gives it to someone else, the company, the boss, the stock market, the economy, and a whole host of others. People don't choose to be poor. They make poor decisions that slowly assemble into a pornous puzzle. Retrace the footprints to poverty and it happens slowly, systematically, and methodically, under a steady diet of poor choices. The choice to cheat on your exams or study. The choice to squander college because your parents paid for it. The choice to lie or to be honest. The choice to drive without insurance. The choice to befriend bad people over good people. The choice to watch TV or read a book. The choice to drive 105 miles per hour in a 55 miles per hour zone. 
The choice to rob the corner convenience store. The choice to overindulge in food or liquor. The choice to believe in people with no track record. The choice to cheat on your significant other. The choice to buy on credit. The choice to get high every weekend. The choice to hire a contractor without a background check. The choice to play video games 30 hours a week. The choice to get married after four weeks of dating. The choice to go into business with incompetent partners. The road to treason is always open. I always loved a good street race. Having owned a variety of juiced up vipers, confrontation was standard. One summer evening after a few drinks, I let my ego take over and I street raced. I overthrottled, spun out of control, crossed into oncoming traffic, and crashed into a palm tree. By the time it was over the new occupant. Of the viper's passenger seat was the trunk of a 30-foot date palm. I was arrested, taken to jail, and charged with DUI and reckless endangerment. Luckily, I didn't kill anyone or myself. In fact, the arresting officer, who wit, nest the entire race, brilliant, huh, stated that had the impact been driver side versus passenger side, I would have been killed. I survived a life or death coin flip. In reflection, my choice to race was a treasonous choice. Treasonous choices are actions that do irreparable harm to your life, your dreams, and your goals. The consequences of treasonous choices throw life onto unintended detours and hazardous roads that are difficult to escape and oftentimes, permanent. Had I killed someone, I would have spent years in jail, spent half my fortune on lawyers, and had to live with the painful reality that I stole someone's life. Life would have instantly transformed, with new circumstances unveiled. No amount of money can keep you from prison or purge your soul from the foolish horror of taking someone's life. Treasonous choices change your life forever. Jack finances his dream home and takes an $800,000 mortgage although he only makes $65,000 per year. Due to loose credit and an exploding housing market, he accepts the loan. He doesn't read the documents and assumes his mortgage lender has his best interests at heart. 18 months later, his interest rate adjusts upward and he can't afford the mortgage, forcing him into foreclosure. His poor credit haunts him for 12 years. He can't qualify for a new mortgage and potential business opportunities go untapped. A fast lane millionaire by age 28, Andre has everything, a beautiful wife, money, a healthy baby daughter, and seven restaurants scattered across the five boroughs. Andre is on top of the world. One Friday night after a few drinks to celebrate his night manager's birthday, Andre drives home drunk. He chooses to think, I'm okay. On his way home he gets into an accident and kills a family of four. Andre is arrested for drunk driving, and after his conviction he spends the next 11 years of his life in prison. He loses his boosie, Nesses and his family. Andre's life forever changed because of multiple treasonous choices. The choice to drink. The choice to drive. The choice to think, I'm okay. The series of choices is plentiful, his exit strategy is clear. He doesn't choose wisely. Recent events from the sports pages illustrate the gravity of treason. Football player Michael Vick engaged in criminal activity and it reshaped his life. His legacy, if you call it that, will never be the same. He lost respectability in two years of his life. He made multiple choices that started with the choice to commiserate with derelicts engaged in criminal activity. Another NFL football player made a choice and it cost him his life. You'd never think that cheating on your wife could end so tragically. It did for Steve McNair when his mistress allegedly shot him to death in a Nashville, Tennessee, condo. While he didn't choose to be murdered, he chose to pursue the woman. He chose the relationship. He chose to cheat. He chose to act. You see, we aren't just talking about one choice here but many that make him complicit to the treason. Steve McNair's choices loaded the gun but someone else pulled the trigger. Your life's steering wheel is a dangerous weapon. Three inches is all it takes. Jerk your life's wheel three tiny inches while speeding and you can steer your life onto a path of no return, or worse, smack into a concrete wall. Like an automobile's steering wheel, your choices are super sensitive. Unfortunately, treasonous roads always have a green light.
People drown in the misery of their own choices while neglecting to acknowledge they are the cause. What's chosen today, impacts forever. You'll see. You'll see, is my mother's code for, I'm right, you're wrong, and time will uncover that truth. As a rebellious teen, mother lobbed a, you'll see, at me after she surrendered to my pleadings for an off-road motorcycle. Mother didn't like the idea and levied her missive, you'll see. It didn't take long for that, you'll see, to come true. Full of testosterone, cocky, and invincible, a 15-year-old kid with no motorcycle experience gambled with his life. I crashed on a dirt road going 50 miles per hour and broke my wrist and two fingers, lost nerves in my knee, and screwed up my neck. While the bones healed, the full array of consequences from the day has not dissipated. Decades later I live with chronic neck pain and have to sleep in unorthodox positions to avoid discomfort. I've spent countless hours and money on physical therapy and chiropractic treatments. Many times I fantasize about going back in time to that day and bitch-slapping that arrogant kid, I wish I could tell him how things are, I wish I could have him read this chapter, I wish he would understand the trajectory, the horsepower, of his choices. Our choices have consequences that transcend decades. This transcendence is horsepower. Every day my discomfort reminds me of that fateful day when I chose poorly. And today, I'm still paying the mortgage of that choice, a mortgage that never amortizes. The butterfly effect. Can you make a choice this instant that can forever alter the trajectory of your future? You can, and it can be the difference between poverty and wealth. When you make minor permutations, choices, that deviate from your initial conditions, profound effects transpire over time. Think of it like a golf club striking a golf ball. When the club face hits the ball square, the ball goes straight and heads toward the hole. But when the club face is rotated a fraction of one degree, the ball's trajectory lands far off course. At impact, the divergence is minor, but as the ball travels further it widens and widens until the gap is so large that getting back on track is nearly impossible. A bad choice can set your trajectory off by only one degree today, but over years the error is magnified. Choices have this type of divergence over time and it's called, impact differential. When your choices are extrapolated throughout the years, the divergence widens. The divergence can be either positive or negative. For example, when I moved to Phoenix from Chicago, the impact differential exploded as time passed. Had I not made this choice my life would be significantly different. I also chose to get a dead-end job as a limo driver, which opened my eyes to a business need. That too was a choice that had extraordinary horsepower and created posy, tithe, impact differential. The 2003 movie The Butterfly Effect starring Ashton Kutcher is great film that excellently illustrates choice horsepower. In the movie, the main characters engage in treasonous choices as youngsters, and you witness how each life unfolds as those treasonous choices permeate through time. You see the impact differential. Recognize that every day you make decisions that will ripple through the years. Question is, will your choice ripple to happiness and wealth? Or depression and poverty? The erosion of horsepower. Your choices have significant trajectory into the future, and the younger you are, the more horsepower they exude. Unfortunately, horsepower fades with age. If this is confusing, think about it in terms of an asteroid that is on a collision course with Earth. When an asteroid is millions of miles out in space, represent, ing your youthful choices, a simple one degree change in trajectory will save the Earth from destruction. This is the power of horsepower. For us older folks, the asteroid is closer to Earth, and closer to our death, which weakens the potency of our choices. A one degree change isn't as effective, and for the same potency, it needs to be 10 degrees. When you are under 25 you have maximum horsepower and your choices discharge an incredible amount of firepower. A simple choice I made more than 20 years ago is still felt today. That's a lot of torque. If you reflect on your choices, you make them in an instant, yet their consequences transcend a lifetime, esp, silly ones made early in life. Your life's choices are like a mature oak tree with millions of branches. The branches symbolize the consequences of your choices. Near the trunk of the tree, the branches are thick, reflecting the decisions you've made early in life, while the top branches are thin, symbolizing decisions near the end of your life. Youthful choices radiate the most strength and fabricate the trunk of your tree. 
As the branches ascend topside through time, they get thinner and weaker. They don't have enough power to bend the tree in new directions because the trunk is thick with age, experience, and reinforced habits. My motorcycle crash had significant horsepower because I feel it today. If you are unmarried with five kids by age 23, where do you think the branches of your choice tree will lead? How thick and unbendable is your choice tree? If you skip classes and are drunk for four years in college, how will that ripple through your choice tree? If your best friend is a drug dealer, where will that branch lead? At age 16, for a school prank, David ignites a smoke bomb in the school bus, and 14 children suffer smoke inhalation. Fortunately, those children recovered quickly, but David's 10-day stay in juvenile detention forever propels David's life down a different path. David meets Rudy, who teaches David the rules of the perfect burglary. This relationship forges David's new career choice, thievery. After avoiding the law for seven years, David is caught, convicted, and sentenced to nine years in prison. Had David not met Rudy, where would he be? A fireman. Banker. Choice and its horsepower transcend. At age 17 and against her parents' wishes, Alyssa, an honor student, leaves home to live with a 31-year-old man she met at the local bar four months earlier. Her boyfriend introduces her to crystal meth, and what initially started as a funny experiment becomes a life-consuming addiction. Alyssa resorts to illegal activities to support her habit, including stealing from her parents. Her reckoning occurs when she is caught at the local mall stealing and sentenced to three years in jail and state-mandated rehabilitation. Had Alyssa listened to her parents, where would she be today? Choice and its horsepower transcend. The smallest choices made in your daily life create habits and lifestyle that forms process, they are the ones that can make the biggest impact. You can't decide to go fast lane because that itself is just an event. A fast lane process is hundreds of choices. Regardless of age, reflect on your life and analyze the forks in the road and where those forks have taken you. The forks are choices, both large and small, and each shares the common thread of having the magnificent power to take you somewhere different. Whatever you decide today impacts tomorrow, weeks, months, years, decades, and yes, generations. If you're younger than 30, your choices are at peak horsepower because they are growing the thick branches of your choice tree. Time to put the pedal to the metal. Chapter Summary, Fast Lane Distinctions The leading cause of poorness is poor choices. The steering wheel of your life is your choices. You are exactly where you chose to be. Success is hundreds of choices that form process. Process forms lifestyle. Choice is the most powerful control you have in your life. Treasonous choices forever impact your life negatively. Your choices have significant horsepower or trajectory into the future. The younger you are, the more potent your choices are and the more horse. Power you possess. Over time, horsepower erodes as the consequences of old choices are thick and hard to bend. Fast Lane 24. Wipe your windshield clean. Until we see what we are. We cannot take steps to become what we should be. Charlotte P. Gilman. Wipe your windshield clean. While pumping gas into my Lamborghini, a teenager once asked me if he could snap some pictures. Sure, go ahead. I replied. After a few various rants and raves about the car, he exclaimed, I gotta get as many pictures as possible cause I'll never be able to afford one of these. Do you see a problem in that conclusion? This young man made a choice to believe he would never own a Lamborghini. He couldn't see beyond his own windshield. Is this a small choice? A treasonous choice? A choice of significant horsepower? This seemingly innocent choice of perception has the excruciating horsepower of treason. It is a crippler of dreams. The teen's choice of perception was poor, and because of it, it would forever lead him to mediocre results. His jury had already deliberated, and the verdict was in, an extravagant car would be always out of his league, and therefore, his choices would reflect that mindset. Unfortunately, he didn't understand the debilitating effect of being clouded to our own self-constructed windshield into the world. The Choice of Perception in the last chapter, we discuss choices and their impact on your life. 
Thus far it's been all about choices of action, physical actions that produce consequences. However, if you look deeper, what causes those actions? What motivates you to act and choose? We have two types of choices. 1. Choices of perception, thought patterns. 2. Choices of action, choosing to read. Choices of perception serve as the impetus to choices of action. If you believe and perceive a certain idea, you are likely to act in accordance with that belief. The difference between the teen at the gas station and me was this, when I witnessed my first Lamborghini as a kid, I thought, someday, I'm gonna own one of those. My choice of perception was strong and further manifested into choices of action that reflected that perception. You see, you choose to interpret events in your particular frame of reference. Your mind labels and categorizes events that surround you. For example, when someone says, dog, you might see a black Labrador, while other people see a poodle. When you see a mansion on the beach, do you think, lucky, or, I'll never own something like that? The first step in making better choices starts with your choice of perception, because your actions evolve from those perceptions. If you lose your job, you can frame it as a negative or a positive. When you're caught speeding, you can be angry or thankful. The choice of perception and its choices start right between your ears and drive themselves into choices of action. Your perception is not the reality. A few years ago, my girlfriend and I were at friend's home for a party. We sat at a small table and noticed an overly exuberant gentleman moving from table to table talking to people. He looked like he was canvassing the room as if he was selling something. He was. He eventually got to our table and unleashed the uncouth, hey, how would you like to earn $10,000 per month? The question was inappropriate for the party so I decided to respond with equal inappropriateness. I asked, $10,000 a month. Really? Thinking I was hooked, he tried to sell me a network marketing opportunity for some herbal supplement. I interrupted him and laughed, listen, I make $10,000 every two days, so for me your opportunity would be a 90% pay cut. Do you think I'm interested? His eyes popped out of their sockets, and after he picked them off the table, he scampered away like a rat without his cheese. In this brief exchange, this man made an assumption, $10,000 a month is a lot of money. It isn't. Money is infinite. Fast lane opportunists can drive opportunities that yield six and seven figures monthly. The difference is perception. I remember the day when I thought $10,000 was a lot of money. It was poor perception and not reality. Earning $1 million in one month is possible if you make the right choices and drive the right fast lane roads. This perception leads to bet, ter choices of action. That guy at the party. He chose a crowded road. Instead of creating a multi-level marketing company, he joined one. Instead of serving the masses through affection, he joined the masses. Wiping the windshield clean starts with language. You can expose your mindset by examining the words in your language and your thoughts. Take for example this comment made on the Fastlane forum. I got engaged last Friday. I had been struggling with this for some time but decided to give marriage one more try. She's a great girl and deserves the best, and I think I can give it to her. When you read this statement do you see assured success? Or pending failure? While I wish the man the best marriage, I see flaccid words that lack confidence, try, I think. This language spells trouble. What would have convinced me? Otherwise. I got engaged last Friday. I had been struggling with this for some time but I decided to get married for the last time. She's a great girl and deserves the best, and I will give it to her. Notice the difference. One is flimsy and the other is firm. Both might seem to say the same thing, but one implies possible failure while the other implies committed success. Your internal language carries weight. If a brain surgeon told you before surgery, I think I can operate on you and I will try to succeed, you should freak out and trade in your hospital gown for some eternal nighties. Altering your words and thought perceptions are akin to wiping your wind, shield clean and seeing beyond your own sphere of sight. How do you manage your choice of perception? What language do you use in your mind? I never. I can't. If only, or do you choose better words? It's possible. I'll overcome. I will. 
I can. If your world is canvassed with words like never and can't, guess what? It's true, you can't and you never will. Is it possible to earn $1 million in one month? Sure it is, just ask the guy who does it. What makes his windshield different from yours? Good choices of perception translate into good choices of action. To change your perception is to change your future actions. The goal of this book is to change your perception about wealth and money. Believe that retirement at any age is possible. Believe that old age is not a prerequisite to wealth. Believe that a job is just as risky as a business. Believe that the stock market isn't a guaranteed path to riches. Believe that you can be retired just a few years from today. So how do you upload new beliefs and overwrite the old ones? Find the information, resources, and the people that align with the new beliefs. For myself, I pursued the stories of those who acquired wealth fast and soon learned that get rich quick wasn't a myth. I never found that 19-year-old who got rich piling. Part 6, Your Vehicle to Wealth, You Money into Mutual Funds However, I did find 24-year-old millionaire inventors, business founders, authors, and website owners. If you want extraordinary results, you're going to need extraordinary thinking. Unfortunately, extraordinary is not found trapped in society's gravity of thinking and the beliefs that fuel them. Steering tips, better choices and a better life. As your journey progresses, respect yourself and ask, is this a good choice of perception? A good choice of action? Is this going to be treasonous to my dreams and cloud my windshield to a better life? Have I chosen to be a victim or a victor? Have I chosen to surrender or accept the challenge? Changing your life starts with changing choices. The fast lane vehicle to wealth is driven on choice, not asphalt. You start making better choices using two strategies dependent on the decision's gravity. 1. Worst Case Consequence Analysis, WAKA 2. Weighted Average Decision Matrix, WAM WCCA is designed to steer you away from perilous detours and treasonous choices. Conversely, WADM is designed to help you make better big decisions with multiple contingencies. This dual-pronged attack works on the choice extremes, a prevention of disastrous choices and a facilitator of good choices. Worst Case Consequence Analysis, WACA The first decision tool is Worst Case Consequence Analysis, WCCA, which requires you to become forward-thinking and an analyzer of potential consequences. WCCA asks you to answer three questions about every decision of consequence. 1. What is the worst-case consequence of this choice? 2. What is the probability of this outcome? 3. Is this an acceptable risk? While these three questions might seem lengthy, your analysis process shouldn't. Take longer than a few seconds. You don't need a pen or paper, just your head and a conscious choice of perception. When choices are analyzed using WCCA, potential disasters are exposed and alternatives can be chosen. Unnecessary roads of treason can be bypassed. I use WCCA extensively. For example, several years ago, after several drinks at a local bar, I went home with a woman who was making the moves and wanted to get busy. She pulled the old Harlequin whisper, make love to me. Of course, having known her for all of two hours, I knew this wasn't love but something else. Behind my drunken passion, I ran through my WCCA analysis. What is the worst case outcome of this choice? 1. I could get a sexually transmitted disease. 2. I could get her pregnant and be locked to this person for the rest of my life. 3. I could be falsely accused of rape. What is the probability of these outcomes? 1. STD, 10% based on her outward promiscuity. 2. Pregnancy, 1%. 3. Falsely accused, 0.5%. Is this an acceptable risk? I immediately reasoned hell and no. The 10% or the 1%. I reasoned the risk was too great and that risk had outcomes that could change my life forever. I denied the woman's advances and hid my lust in favor of a better choice. What if I hadn't? Sure, I would have enjoyed a quick romp of fun, but what about afterward? Would I be put in a position of an unplanned pregnancy with a woman I didn't know? 
Would I be condemned with a disease that would jeopardize my health and limit my search for a future partner? The potential consequences of this action had profound treasonous trajectories that I avoided. WCCA comes into play when I drive. Viper, Lamborghini, doesn't matter, other idiot drivers looking for a street race constantly berate me. Sure, I might hit the accelerator hard for three seconds, but in those three seconds, WCCA takes over. What's the worst that could happen? I could kill myself and someone else. Odds. 3%. Knowing my racing competency, the risks are dangerously high. I release the accelerator and don't engage. The other driver. He speeds away with something to prove and in disregard to the potential outcomes. That's okay, maybe there's a reason he's driving a 10-year-old Fartkin Honda and I'm in the Lamborghini. Win the street race, I'll win life. The weighted average decision matrix, 1. Ever wrestle with a tough decision? One day you favor option A and the next day you flounder back to option B, wouldn't it be great if making a tough decision were as simple as picking the higher number? The second decision tool I use compares and quantifies big decisions. You know them, should you move or stay? Quit or continue? Go back to college or not? For WADM, you need paper and a pencil. Or alternatively, you can visit helpmydecision.com and let the web work the calculation for you. Keep in mind, WADM is for big decisions, so you might use this a few times a year whereas WCCA can be used daily. With WADM, decision-making is easy as it isolates and prioritizes factors relevant to your decisions and then quantifies each decision with a value. The higher value reflects the better decision. For example, if you had a choice between moving to Detroit or Phoenix, WADM would yield a simple numerical valuation like Detroit 88 and Phoenix 93. Based on the number, Phoenix is the better choice. While WADM is subjective and requires your unfettered objectivity, it is a great tool for identifying which choice is more favorable to your preferences. To use WADM, a minimum of two choices is needed, but it could be used for more. Let's say you do indeed live in Detroit and are considering moving to Phoenix. You struggle with the decision and can't get clarity. One day you want to move. The next you want to stay. Usually, this waffling occurs when there are too many decision factors within each choice. Get a pencil and paper. Make three columns on your paper, one headed factors and the other two for each choice, Detroit and Phoenix. Second, what decision factors are important in your decision? Weather. Schools. Cost of living. Being near family. Write down all factors relevant to the decision, no matter how small. Write these factors in the factor column. Your WADM would now look like this. Thirdly, next to each decision factor, weigh its importance to the decision from 1 through 10, with 10 being the most important. For example, you are seasonally depressed, so weather is assigned a 10 in your matrix. Subsequently, your children are almost 18 so you decide that a good school system isn't a top priority and it receives a 3. Do this for all factors. Now your WADM looks like this. After each criterion is ranked 1 through 10, grade each choice 1 through 10 for each decision factor. The school system in Detroit. You give it a 4. In Phoenix, you give the school system a 5, as you determine it is slightly better. You assign entertainment in Detroit an 8 as they are home to your mighty red wings, while Phoenix gets a 6. Continue for each decision factor within each choice. Your WADM should now look something like this. Next, for each row, multiply the weight times the grade and put that number next to the grade in parentheses. For example, in the entertainment row, Detroit receives a 40, 8 weight times 5 grade, while Phoenix receives a 16, 8 weight times 2 grade. Do this for all rows. Your WADM should now look like this. The final step is simply to add up the graded weight columns to get a final number for each choice. The highest number will be the choice you favor. Your final WADM would look like this. In this hypothetical example, you should stay in Detroit because it received the highest score, 232 over 228. 
The WADM is a great tool for making big decisions as long as you are perfectly honest with the factor waiting. I've used WADM many times in my life to bring clarity to tough decisions. It proved I needed to move to Phoenix, it offered insight into why it was time to sell my business, and it even steered me clear of some bad business investments. In 2005, I had an opportunity to invest in a Las Vegas restaurant. After I conducted my diligence on the opportunity and the founders, it was time to make a decision. I couldn't decide. I solved my decision paralysis with a WADM analysis that indicated I should turn the investment down. I did. A little over a year later, I discovered this investment turned south and that the investors lost most of their money. The WADM gave clarity to decision ambiguity and saved me from losing $125,000. If you examine a map of the country, you'll find millions of roadways, freeways, streets, avenues, boulevards, all leading somewhere different. Your choices unearth those roads, and they are either impressive shortcuts or perilous detours. These two decision tools are navigational tools for your wealth journey. Get your eyes off the rearview mirror. Today is the starting line for the rest of your life. Yes, today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. The problem with the past is that we remember memories we shouldn't, and we don't forget what we should. If your eyes are stuck in the rearview mirror, you're stuck in the past. If you're stuck in the past, you're not looking ahead. If you're not looking ahead, you can't hit the mark of your future. The universe doesn't care about your past. It is blind to it. The universe doesn't care that I wore pink pants in high school. Hey, remember Miami Vice? The universe doesn't care that I got in a fight with Francis Franken and lost. The universe doesn't care about your MBA from UCLA, your drug dealing father, or that you wet your bed in junior high. The universe simply doesn't care. One person and one person only weaponizes past transgressions, you. If the universe doesn't remember, why should you? Being the youngest of three siblings, you can bet I was the subject of some vile comments. Fat, stupid, you name it. However, just because my brother called me an idiot for 12 years doesn't make it my reality. Your past never equals your future unless you allow it. Think about a coin flip. No matter how many times it's flipped, the next flip is always random. Probability cannot be attached to a future flip based on the past. Your past is the same. Just because you failed at five relationships doesn't mean your next will fail, especially if you learn from them. Just because you flipped burgers three hours ago doesn't mean you can't be a millionaire next year. The universe forgets, just like the universe forgot I mopped floors and delivered pizza not long ago. Is your memory treasonous? Your memories have the same makeup as your choices. They're treasonous, muted, or accelerative. Unlike choices consequences, you have a choice how your past is classified. The records of the past can be sealed. For example, if you lost your life savings in a restaurant franchise that went bankrupt soon after you invested, your memory could be either accelerative or treasonous. Your memory and its perception could be. Business ownership is a big risk. I'll never do that again or, next time, I'm going to be selling franchises, not buying them. The former is treasonous, while the latter is accelerative. You have a choice in framing failure and framing the past. It serves or hinders. When I reflect on my own failures, I let them serve me to affect future change. It's a part of the responsibility-slash-accountability process. What did I learn? What can I change in the future? What should I forget? After I crashed my Viper and nearly killed myself, I remember the haze of almost losing everything. I didn't want to repeat those feelings, and their memory served my future to affect change, street racing is for morons. Alternatively, I could allow ego to reign, keep street racing, and boast, I'll never lose another race again. While the consequences of our choices can't be manipulated, you can manipulate your memories to serve you. My life is not defined by being picked last in high school gym class. If your past defines your existence, it will be impossible for you to become the person you need to become in the future. Chapter Summary, Fast Lane Distinctions Your choices of action manifest from your choices of perception. What you choose to perceive, or not perceive, will manifest itself to a choice of action, or inaction. 
you can change your choice of perception by aligning yourself with those who experience the perception as reality. Worst case consequence analysis helps avoid treasonous choices. The weighted average decision matrix can help you make better big decisions by clarifying alternatives and their internal factors. The universe has no memory, only you do. Your past can be accelerative or treasonous. You choose the classification. If your eyes are transfixed to the past, you can't become the person you need to become in the future. Fast Lane 25. Deodorize flatulent headwinds. Ridicule is the tribute paid to the genius by the mediocrities. Oscar Wilde. The Fast Lane's natural headwind. The greatest invention of mankind was the airplane because it defied the natural force of gravity and seemingly violated the laws of physics. How could something so heavy float in the air? What made Orville and Wilbur Wright's achievement so spectacular wasn't just the act of flying, but the act of breaking free from society's gravitational pull. Flying is impossible. You guys are nuts. You are wasting your time. Foolish. Before they could even pursue flying, the Wright brothers had to break free of society's natural headwind, the natural social conditioning that impregnates all young minds. A Fastlane forum member posted this. Go into a kindergarten class and ask the kids how many of them can sing. Every hand will go up. Fast forward 13 years and ask the same class of seniors the same question. Only a few hands will go up. What changed? The kindergarten kids believed they could sing because no one had told them otherwise. Perfectly stated. We must not hear the naysayers, because they have been conditioned by society. Society will grind a constant headwind at the grill of your vehicle. You can't worry about deviating from social norms, because the norm is to be two paychecks from broke. If you want to push beyond average results produced by average people, you'll need to adopt an uncommon approach that doesn't fall in the favor of everyone. The more uncanny and exceptional you strive to be, the more you need to fight through social indoctrination. Extraordinary wealth will require you to have extraordinary beliefs. Turn your back to farting headwinds. If you turn your back to a headwind, it becomes an accelerant. I had to do this, otherwise I would have failed. After graduating from college, I was expected to find a good job. I didn't and instead dove into entrepreneurial ventures. My family thought I was crazy and proclaimed, you're wasting a five-year educa, tie-in. Peers thought I was delusional. Oh dear, delivering pizza and chauffeuring limousines while two business degrees hung from the wall. Women wouldn't date me because I broke the professional, college-educated mold the fairy tale espoused. Going fast lane and building momentum will require you to turn your back at the people who fart headwinds in your direction. You have to break free of society's gravitational force and their expectations. If you aren't mindful to this natural gravity, life can denigrate into a viscous self-perpetuating cycle, which is society's prescription for normal, get up, go to work, come home, eat, watch a few episodes of Law and Order, go to bed, then repeat, day after day after day. Before you know it, 45 years have passed and you need another 25 just to make your financial plan work. Time passes, dreams die, and what remains? An old withered body forlorn for what could have been. Who farts headwinds? They are. 1. Friends and family who just don't get it. 2. Educational institutions that preach slow lane dogma. 3. Parents who are conditioned to believe wealth is for other people. 4. Slow lane gurus who claim your house is the best investment. 5. Slow lane gurus who say $100 invested today will be worth $10 million in 50 years. 6. Your environment. Escaping human headwind below viators. People who don't empower your goals are human headwind bloviators. They add friction to the journey. When you spout excitement over actions or ideas, bloviators react with doubt and disbelief and use conditioned talking points such as, oh that won't work, someone is already doing it, and why bother. In motivational circles, they call them dream stealers. You must turn your back on them. Every entrepreneur has bloviators in their life. Network marketers consider me a bloviator. These people are normal obstacles to the fast lane road trip. Remember, these people have been socially conditioned to believe in the preordained path. 
they don't know about the fast lane, nor do they believe it. Anything outside of that box is foreign, and when you talk fast lane, you may as well be speaking Klingon. As a producer, you are the minority, while consumers are the rest. To be unlike everyone who isn't rich, you, who will be rich, require a strong defense, otherwise, their toxicity infects your mindset. Commiserating with habitual, negative, limited thinkers is treasonous. Uncontrolled, these headwinds lead directly to the couch and the video game console. Yes, the old, if you hang out with dogs, you get fleas. This dichotomy makes you a blossoming flower that needs protection, water, and plenty of sun. Negative friends, family, or co-workers are dark clouds. Defend yourself or suffer the consequence of slow assimilation to mediocrity. Escaping environmental headwinds while you might redirect human-originated headwinds, environmental factors aren't so easily controlled. What are environmental headwinds? For me, it was Chicago. I was seasonally depressed and needed sun for Mativa, Tyan. Chicago was my hurricane force headwind, and if I wanted success, I needed to turn my back. I escaped and moved to one of the sunniest places on the planet. Had I not turned my back to my environmental headwind, this book would not exist. Where would I be today if I hadn't turned my back to the tornado? I know I wouldn't be here, happy, and retired 30 years early. Nope, I'd be on the Kennedy Expressway fighting traffic and strung out on antidepressants. I'll pass. I made a choice to turn my environmental headwind into a tailwind. While I can't blame all my problems on my environment, they enforced this disconnect between interest in wealth and commitment. Another headwind could be your work environment. If your hated job drains the life out of you, it's a headwind. After a long workday and you have nothing left for your dreams and your fast lane plan, you're done. The headwind keeps you trapped. While growing up, one of the successful entrepreneurs I studied was Sylvester Stallone. While Sly is thought to be an actor, he's really an entrepreneur. His rocky screenplay was his product that touched millions, and he sold it under a specific set of circumstances, which included the provision that he had to play the lead role. Sly was no stranger to the law of affection. One of the telling elements of Sly's success story was his resistance to getting a normal job. He mentioned that if he'd taken a corporate job, his dream would have died because he knew the gravity of a job was inescapable for him. He recognized that a corporate environment would have been a headwind. If your environment puts a stiff headwind in your face, you must take active steps to remove yourself from the headwind. What headwinds are keeping you from pursuing your dreams? Take control and make choices that can alter the trajectory of your life. Creating accelerative winds. My headwind was my environment. For you, it might be negative friends or other slow lane influences. When you turn your back on these people, you break the headwind. When you associate with people who empower your goals, you create a wind at your back and build momentum. Positive people nurture your growth, suit your failures, and invest in your dreams. Good people are conduits to your dreams, not just in motivational fuel, but in extending your opportunity reach. People are like roads, they can either bring opportunity or distress into your life. The quality of these roads solely depends on the quality of the person. Think of the relationships in your life like an army platoon readying for battle. Who are you going to war with? Your friend Mark who is always late, lies, and passes out drunk every Saturday night. Your friend Lucy who has a new job every three weeks, was caught stealing at the mall, and is only looking for a super rich guy to carry her off into the sunset. Are these people you can count on? Are these the people you want to go to battle with? If not, you need to pick better warriors to have on your team. How? Join entrepreneur clubs, attend networking events, ally yourself with like minders, get yourself around people who subscribe to a fast lane, anything is possible mindset, and decide who you want on your team of warriors. Read books and autobiographies of those who have the kind of success you want. Find a mentor. Join entrepreneur forums with a fast lane mindset, like the fast lane forum. Not a week goes by when someone doesn't email me, this forum changed my life. That's a tailwind. Folks, this is war and your life is in the balance. You need warriors who are impervious to the Death Star and can deactivate the slow lane tractor beam, 
not fearful pansies who drop their cargo at the first sign of imperial slow laners. Reflect on your environment and your relationships, and recognize the headwinds. Then choose accelerative action, can these headwinds be removed, ignored, or man-aged? Unlike natural wind, you are the arbiter of your headwinds. Success follows those who break the headwind and put it at their back. Significant other or significant distraction. The worst headwind can be the person who sits in the passenger seat of your vehicle. They sit and lecture you on your dumb ideas and remind you of your failures. Or they don't say anything and just distract you, they fiddle with the radio, adjust. Part 6, Your Vehicle to Wealth, You. The climate control, roll the windows up and down, and hum old Duran Duran tunes. Or they play the role of a backseat driver, Charles. Charles. Do this. Do that. Turn there. No, dummy. What possibly can be so hazardous to your trip and who is this person? How did they get in your car? This person is your significant other. By talking with other aspiring entrepreneurs, I've learned that significant others, husbands, wives, fiancés, girlfriends, boyfriends, can be some of the biggest headwinds out there. Having a life partner who doesn't ascribe to your life's ideals and philosophies is like towing a trailer full of wet manure. If your partner doesn't subscribe to an entrepreneurial philosophy and tows the slow lane road, can you expect to grow together in unison? Someone fighting with you in your corner is accelerative, if they serve as the opposition, they become treasonous. One of my first girlfriends was A-plus marriage material. But she fully subscribed to the slow lane philosophy. She couldn't understand why I was so fervent to be an entrepreneur. Our relationship stagnated as my failures grew, and the relationship eventually ended. This occurrence wasn't either one of our faults, we just were two different people on two different paths. Bad relationships are roadblocks to fast lane success. They drain energy and dim dreams. It's like rowing a boat upstream. Unwilling passengers add weight, distract, and sometimes are expensive to remove. Yes, divorce is treasonous and expensive, both emotionally and financially. Traveling down the road less traveled is already difficult. Why compound the journey by weighing down the car with someone who doesn't share your destination? Are you in the right relationship with a person who believes in you and your goals? Or is your relationship just like lukewarm water, not bad, not good, just comfortable enough to stand pat? If so, it might be time to evaluate your passenger. Chapter Summary, Fast Lane Distinctions The natural gravity of society is not to be exceptional, but average. Toxic relationships drain energy and detract from your goals to be extraordinary. The people in your life are like your comrades in a battle platoon. They can save you, help you, or destroy you. Good relationships are accelerative to your process, while bad relationships are treasonous. Fast Lane 26 your primordial fuel, time. Time isn't a commodity, something you pass around like a cake. Time is the substance of life. When anyone asks you to give your time, they're really asking for a chunk of your life. Antoinette Bosco. The $6 bucket of chicken. Why will most people never get rich? Look no further than a $6 bucket of chicken. It made big news, a major fast food restaurant offered a free bucket of chicken to anyone who had an internet coupon. People flocked to restaurant locations and waited for hours, all for a free $6 bucket of chicken. Know anyone who would stand in line for hours just to get something free? Are you one of them? These stories are common, and yet my reaction is the same, what the hell is wrong with people? I'll tell you, these people value their time at zero. It's free. Like the air we breathe, they're convinced that time is abundant and in endless supply. They live as if they were immortal. They are certain that time, the fuel of their life, never runs empty. I wonder if these people had three weeks left to live, would they be standing in line for a bucket of chicken? What if they had three months? Three years? At what level of mortality would they rule that standing in line for three hours for free chicken is not good use of time? The greasy chicken truth, Value your time poorly and you will be poor. When time is wasted as a lifestyle choice you will be stranded in places you don't want to be. Take a look around. How do your friends, family, 
and peers value their time. Are they standing in line to save 4 bucks? Are they driving 40 minutes to save $10? Are they parked on the sofa anxiously waiting to see who wins Dancing with the Stars? The average American watches more than 4 hours of TV each day. In a 65-year life, that person will have spent 9 years glued to the tube. Why? Simple. Life sucks. Life needs an escape. Life is no good. Show me someone who spends hours online playing Mafia Wars or Farmville, and I'll show you someone who probably isn't very successful. When life sucks, escapes are sought. I don't need television because I invested my time into a real life worth living, not a fictie, Tyus escape that airs every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Again, majority thinking yields mediocrity, and for that majority, time is an asset that is undervalued and mindlessly squandered. The Titanic, how fast is your ship sinking? People standing in line to save money ought to hold a picket sign announcing to the world, I value money more than my life. That choice is a primal mistake. A great example to time's reigning dominance over money comes from the 1997 movie, Titanic. As the ship sinks and few lifeboats remain, Caledon Hockley, a wealthy steel industrialist played by Billy Zane, bargains for his life with a ship's officer and offers cash in exchange for a lifeboat seat. The officer rebukes the tycoon's proposition with a stiff certainty, your money can't save you any more than it can save me. Reflect on that for a moment. Your money can't save you any more than it can save me. Powerful. In those eight seconds, the true value of time is exposed and we intersect with the certainty to our own ticking death clock. You see, once your time is gone, you're dead. And when your clock ceases to tick, no amount of cash will save you from the end. Fastlaners understand that time is the gas tank of life. When the gas tank runs dry, life ends. Time is the greatest asset you own, not money, not the 1969 restored Mustang, not grandpa's old coin collection. Time. The fact is all of us are on a sinking ship. Is your time treated as such? Is it treated fairly or carelessly? Or is your primordial fuel squandered as if the tank will never run empty? You were born rich and will die broke. Time is the great equalizer. You were born with a full tank of gas. There are no refilling stations, and your one fill-up occurred the moment you took your first breath. Time can't be created outside of your mortal limits. Sure, we might be able to stretch a 76-year lifespan to 82 with good health and diet, but within mortality, time is transformed from infinite to finite. The greatest theft of all humanity is to act as if our time on this earth is infinite when it isn't. The reality is that time is deathly scarce, while money is richly abundant. On any given day, $3 trillion is exchanged in the world currency markets. That's $3 trillion. To give that perspective, you can spend a million dollars a day for 8,000 years and you still wouldn't have spent $3 trillion. That's 109 lifetimes to quantify the total currency trading volume that exists for one day. Money is abundant and will be abundant as long as the world's governments print more. Now, since you don't have 8,000 years of life, isn't it logical to conclude that money is an abundant resource while time is not? You can always acquire more money, but you cannot defy mortality. The irony of financial fortune is that no matter how much you have, you'll die flat broke. You cannot escape the continual combustion of time as your tank drips time every second. You can live in blissful happiness or in a miserable depression, time is indifferent and it just bleeds away. Since time is scarce, wouldn't it make sense not to waste three hours of your life for a six-dollar bucket of chicken? Indentured time is the ransom of free time. There are two types of time that will make up your lifespan, your free time and your indentured time. Your lifespan equals free time plus indentured time. Free time is yours to spend as you please, TV, a jog in the park, video games, sleeping, eating, vacation. If you're like most, your free time is lumped on evenings and weekends, where time is not exchanged for money. Indentured time is the opposite, it's the total time spent earning money and the consequences of that spent time. When you awake in the morning, shower, dress, drive to the train station, wait, ride to work, and then work for 8 hours, this is indentured time. When you spend your entire weekend recharging from the work week, this is indentured time. 
Indentured time is actual work and the work you must do for the work. Morning rituals, traffic, compiling reports at home, solitary recharges, whatever time spent earning a buck is indentured time. If you won the lottery, you'd quit your job because indentured time is no longer required and is suddenly replaced with free time. Money buys free time and eliminates indentured time. However, the irony of your free time is it isn't free, it's bought and paid for by your indentured time. You enjoy a two-week vacation because it was paid for by a year of indentured time. You can relax with a cold beer on the couch because you paid for it earlier in the day with eight hours of indentured time. Indentured time becomes the ransom of your free time. The right time versus the wrong time. There's the right time and the wrong time. The right time is free time, indentured time is the wrong time. The slow lane ransoms time, time at the job and time invested in the markets. Remember, five indentured days for two free days is a bad trade. A financial plan with time as the adjudicator is not a good financial plan. If you were born into slavery, your life would be 100% indentured time with 0% free time. While total time can't be manipulated, you can manipulate your time ratio. Wouldn't it be nice to have one day of indentured time and six days of free time? If you can steal free time from the hands of indentured time, life will have more of the right time versus the wrong time, dump the junk in the trunk. If you race cars at the drag strip, you know that every ounce of weight counts. Racers remove everything non-essential to make the car as light as possible. This increases efficiency, speed, and performance, resulting in faster finishes. Unnecessary weight forces the car to work harder. Yet on our road trip to wealth, we're guilty of adding weight. Our vehicle is burdened with junk in the trunk that coerces us to work harder. And when you work harder long enough, it wears you out and breaks you down. This debilitating weight is parasitic debt. Parasitic debt is everything you owe the world. It is the excrement of lifestyle servitude. Your shiny new infinity financed at 60 monthly payments, your home mortgage financed over 30 years, your fancy designer clothes four months removed from out of fashion, and yes, even that insidious furniture that seemed like such a good idea at the time. All of this crap creates servitude and forces indentured time. When you're forced to work, you limit choice, and limited choices close roads. Aside from my mother's creepy doll collection, nothing is more frightening than a parasite leech to my neck, sucking my blood. Parasitic debt is a counter, wait to your road trip, it's a bloodsucker that steals free time, energy, freedom, and health, all foes to true wealth. Parasitic debt consumes free time. The leading cause of indentured time is parasitic debt. Surely you've heard the phrase, thief of hearts. When it comes to parasitic debt, it is the thief of lives. Parasitic debt is a gluttonous pig that gorges on free time and shits it out as indentured time. Any debt that forces you to work is expensed from free time and shifts it to indentured time. Debt needs a constant drip of blood, and that blood comes from your gas tank of life, time. And since time is fixed, an increase in indentured time comes from only one source, your free time. The cost of parasitic debt. The average American owes more than they are worth. Having a lifestyle built on credit creates lifestyle servitude in the form of indentured time. And because total time is finite, indentured time grows by pilfering from free time. Indentured time leads to the sidewalk. The next time you buy some fancy gadget on credit, know exactly what you are buying. You're buying parasitic debt that eats free time and excretes it into indentured time. For example, if you buy an audio system that costs $4,000 and you make $10 per hour, what's the real price? What is the weight of the poop? That price is 400 hours of your free time, since you must work 400 hours times $10 per hour to repay the debt. Add 10% interest and your final cost stacks up to 440 hours of your free time added to your weight burden. So next time you whip out the visa, calculate the real cost. How much free time is this going to cost me? Everything we buy has not one cost, but two. One, the actual dollar cost. Two, the free time transformed into indentured time. The law of chocolate chip cookies. When I first moved out on my own, I quickly learned the law of chocolate chip cookies, if the cookies don't get into the grocery cart, they don't get home. 
And if they don't get home, they don't get in my mouth. And if they don't get in my mouth, they don't transform into belly fat. Parasitic debt follows the same law. Control parasitic debt by controlling its source, instant gratification, a trait of the sidewalk. The next time you feel compelled to buy some trinket at Macy's, ask yourself, will this be obsolete in six months and land in the garage with the rest of the junk? In four months, will this stupid tribal t-shirt be relegated to the dusty side of the closet reserved for painting smocks? Again, when you purchase the next greatest fashion fad without truly being able to afford it, you open the floodgates to parasitic debt that flows downstream to the sidewalk. If the cost of that product doesn't make it to your credit card, it doesn't become parasitic. You become a protector of free time. Think. Will this purchase take freedom? Will I own this or will it own me? While some choose servitude behind iron bars, others choose servitude behind velvet walls. Both are the same. The ultimate wealth is having the free time to live how you want to live. The fast lane is about being both lifestyle rich as well as time rich. A poor valuation of free time leads to poorness. Rich or poor, time is equally possessed, shared, and consumed by all. Every day, you use it. I use it. Your neighbor uses it. No one gets more and no one gets less. 24 hours for everybody. No one has an unfair advantage. You, me, we all have 24 hours to consume, expire, and spend. Time is the ultimate equalizer. Then why do so few get rich while the rest wallow from paycheck to paycheck? The distinction lies in the valuation of free time, the chosen roadmap, and the acquisition of parasitic debt. Guess the behaviors, rich or poor. This person sleeps until noon. This person watches hours of reality TV. This person drives two hours to save $20. This person buys airline tickets with multiple layovers to save $100. This person spends hours surfing social networks and gossip blogs. This person is a level 10 druid in World of Warcraft. This person watches every Chicago Cubs game, just kidding, all you loyal Cubs fans. Behind the tangled roots of poorness, you will find a poor valuation of free time, which breeds from bad choices. Time losers are poor evaluators of time. These are the people camped out at Walmart at 4 a.m. waiting to grab the early bird sales. These are the people sleeping outside best by hoping to score a free 32-inch HDTV. These are the people waiting outside IKEA hoping to get a free breakfast. Time losers are also inconvenient savers. The inconvenient saver desperately clutches onto every dollar, fearful it may never return. Extreme inconvenience is never a match for saving money. For example, an old friend of mine wanted an exercise bike and found it on sale at a store miles away or home. I told her just to buy the darn thing locally and pay the higher price, which was an extra $29. Nope, she was an inconvenient saver. Instead, she drove one hour to save $29. Total time spent. Two and a half hours. Subtract gas and the total valuation of her time is about $5 per hour. Last I checked, she doesn't work for $5 per hour, but has no problem wasting her free time at this rate. The inconvenient saver gladly wastes time to save money. From plane tickets with multiple stops to shared shuttle air, port service, inconvenience is no match for saving a few bucks an hour. If these people had three months to live, would they be outside Best Buy in a sleeping bag waiting? Six months. Six years. At what threshold will these people pack up their sleeping bag on the sidewalk and say, gee, what the hell am I doing sleeping on a sidewalk outside of an electronic store? Is this a smart use of my life? Sidewalkers sleep on sidewalks. Fastlaners exalt time as their primary consideration in decision-making because it's our most valued asset. Fast laners are frugal with time, while slow laners are the millionaire fast lane. Frugal with money. Sidewalkers and slow laners use money as the sole criterion in 185 decision making, which job pays the most. Where is the cheapest item? How can I get some free chicken? Money is scarce and time brings up the rear and sweeps up the mess. If you want to be rich, you have to start thinking rich. Time is king. Chapter Summary, 
Fast Lane Distinctions Fast laners regard time as the king of all assets. Time is deftly scarce, while money is richly abundant. Indentured time is time you spend to earn money. Free time is spent as you please. Your lifespan is made up of both free time and indentured time. Free time is bought and paid for by indentured time. Fast laners seek to transform indentured time into free time. Parasitic debt eats free time and excretes it as indentured time. Lifestyle extravagances have two costs, the cost itself and the cost to free time. Parasitic debt has to be stopped at the source, instant gratification. Fast Lane 27. Change that dirty, stale oil. Education is what remains after one has forgotten everything he learned in school. Albert Einstein. Change the oil every 3,000 miles. The first lesson of car ownership, change the oil every 3,000 miles. Neglect the lesson and your car dies well before its useful life. Frequent oil changes keep your car running efficiently, unchanged oil goes stale and turns the ride rough. Rough rides stall to the shoulder of the road. The fast lane road trip demands fresh oil changes. But what is oil? Oil is a dukkha, tie-in. Knowledge. Street smarts. But be careful, it must be the right oil and for the right purpose. Sidewalkers don't bother with oil. After 3,000 miles, they're done. Graduation is the last oil change. Slow laners oil their vehicles for the explicit purpose of raising intrinsic value. Advanced education and certifications, what's going to command a bigger salary? Fast laners oil their vehicles until they hit the junkyard. Graduation is not the end, it is the beginning. Face it. What you know today is not enough to get you where you need to be tomorrow. You must constantly reinvent yourself, and reinvention is education. Unfortunately, graduation traditionally signals the end of education. Regardless of your graduating age, adulthood begins. The party is over and real life begins. To cease learning at graduation is wealth suicide. Your most effective earning years happen after graduation, so wouldn't it be smart to continue the educational process long after formal schooling? Jim Gallagher graduated 11 years ago and is unemployed. Jim is a stock broker, but because of internet technology his expertise has become endangered and flirts with extinction. Jim's education for that specific job set has become dated and no longer applies to the current world. The world has moved on, yet Jim and his education have not. Jim contemptuously takes a menial sales job at a local furniture store. His financial plan stalls because he operates with the same stale oil last changed 11 years ago. Jim fails to change his oil so Jim's road trip to wealth also fails. Education, your oil, is a critical component to your wealth road trip. When you continually inject yourself with new education, new skills, and new competencies, new roads open and things run smoothly. The right education has incredible horsepower. Education's role. Education is virtuous under both slow lane and fast lane roadmaps, but their roles are profoundly different. In the slow lane, education is used to elevate intrinsic value, while in the fast lane it is used to facilitate and grow the business system. Also, fast lane education is secured by methods that do not produce parasitic debt or conformity. The purpose of education within the fast lane is to amplify the power of the money tree in the business system. You're not a cog in the wheel, you learn to build the wheel. For example, if I go to a training seminar that gives me skills to hire top gun salespeople, I'm engaged in activities that specifically enhance the fertility of my business and my money tree. If I read a book on a new computer technology that illustrates how to create new interactive website features, I'd be learning to facilitate the system. Again, fast lane education is to foster growth of the BUSI, NES system. Conversely, slow lane education is designed to specifically enhance the intrinsic value of the person receiving the education. It is to become a gear in the system. A fast lane forum user had an opportunity to pursue an MBA and he asked if it was worth it. My answer typically would be no, but this scenario was different. First, the MBA had no money cost, only time cost, as the government was pay, ing for it. Second, 
This gentleman espoused the fast lane ideology so his purpose was not intrinsic value elevation, but expansion of his knowledge to facilitate a fast lane system. I voted yes. I don't know how. If an oil change puts your car on a lift for months or years, what's the point? Your continued education must not come laden with conformity or parasitic debt, but must facilitate your fast lane system. How? Make the real world your university. Yes, you are your own university. Ask any successful entrepreneur and they will validate this truth, you learn from engagement, from doing, and from getting out and taking repeated action, more so than from any book or professor. But, I don't know how, you cry. Oh, stop. Public enemy number one on the most, used excuses list is, I don't know how. Well, why don't you know how? I'll tell you why. You don't know because you haven't taught yourself how, nor have you wanted to know how badly enough. You see, it is easier to relent under the weight of, I don't know how, than it is to actively pursue the knowledge. In today's information society, there is absolutely no excuse not to find out how. I graduated from college with two business degrees, marketing and finance. Neither of them was related to computer science. I graduated with no computer programming experience. Yet I made my millions on the internet. Funny, after 13 years of expensive institutional education, I never took a formal class about the internet or web technologies. Heck, my computer classes were limited to introductory business courses. If I didn't go to school to learn the internet, how the heck did I learn and become educated within this skill set? I sought to change my oil frequently. I educated myself. I read books. I hit the library. I spent hours on the web and read articles, tutorials, wikis. I sought and consumed knowledge. Years ago, when I started my career with internet media, I could have easily quit and leaned on the obvious, I don't know how. I don't know how to program a website. I don't know how to design graphics. I don't know how to manage a server. I don't know how to write marketing copy. These excuses are like a plastic bag ready to smother your dreams, but only if you stick your head in the bag. Instead, my vision of a website didn't end with, I don't know how, but started there. So, get your head out of the bag. Had I not refreshed my skill set, my oil, my journey would have stalled. My religious pursuit of knowledge kept me efficient in an ever-changing world and primed me for fast lane opportunities. Education didn't end with graduation, it started. And best of all, my self-taught education was a twin-turbo acceleration into the fast lane, my skills didn't come loaded with parasitic debt or conformity. Education is freely available. The greatest travesty of the free world is the underuse of knowledge. Walk into your local bookstore and inhale. Smell that. That's the smell of infinite knowledge. Walk into your local library and look around. Amazing. Wall-to-wall -wall books, free for the taking. Imagine if you could digest every book, every paragraph, and every sentence. Would, I don't know, be a detriment to your success? I'm astonished that education is freely available, yet most choose not to take it. Education is unplucked fruit from a tree, and all it needs is a ladder. Yet, most people cling to the limiting belief that, I can't afford education. Sorry, but it's an excuse to be lazy. Education is free for your consumption. Infinite knowledge is at your finger, tips and the only thing preventing you from getting it is you. Yes, you. Turn off. The TV, pick up a book, and read it. Quit playing Guitar Hero and hit the library. Quit playing Game Boy grab ass and hit the books. A committed fastlaner has his nose in a book weekly. He attends seminars. He trolls business forums. He's on Google, searching different topics and strategies. You have the innate power to become an expert at anything not requiring physical talent. Anything. No book in the world can make me a professional basketball player or a professional singer, but books can transfigure novices to experts in non-physical disciplines. You can become a currency trading expert. Real estate. Business. Web programming. Sales. A public speaker. The expertise for any discipline not requiring physical coordination is out there. 
What does it take? Your commitment of pursuit, and then the biggie, applying it. When I remodeled my house, the walls of my grand foyer needed to be faux painted. Faux finishing is a complicated painting technique that's used to create lavish surfaces with depth and luminance. I had two choices, call a professional or learn to do it myself. Since I was retired, I viewed this as a fun challenge, so I opted to do it myself. I hit the internet and watched a few hours of video tutorials. Then I hit the Home Depot and bought supplies. Over the next several days I practiced on card, board boxes. Within a week I became proficient at faux painting. I built myself a skill in one week. Days earlier I was in the sphere of, I don't know how, and days later, I possessed a new skill that I could aptly sell if I wanted. The best faux painters earn $10 per square foot. In one week, I built myself a skill that opened a tiny road into the fast lane equation. Skills and expertise are waiting just for you. No one drops a book on your lap and gifts knowledge. You have to seek it, process it, and then use it. The acquisi, tie-in and application of knowledge will make you rich. So where do you find infinite knowledge inexpensively? Like the air you breathe, it's all around you, like an apple tree waiting to be plucked. Bookstores, books possess the greatest return for your educational dollar. Buy them, borrow them, or steal them. Just read them. The library, the greatest free repository of knowledge and the disabler of the, I can't afford to buy books, excuse. I got my start at the library. Internet forums, find like-minded congregations and learn from those who have succeeded. Find tailwinds. Internet classes, can be pricey, but convenient. Internet blogs slash podcasts slash screencasts slash webcasts, another excuse destroyer. Seminars, good seminars bring good value, assuming they are sponsored by the right entities and not get rich quick gurus. Television, cable TV has turned television educational. Deviate from the mind, less reality TV garbage and tune into channels with educational value, history, discovery, science, HGTV, military, and National Geographic. Continuing education classes, offered mostly by community colleges, these classes offer a wide array of formal training in specific disciplines. Free magazines, visit tradepub.com and freebuysmag.com and sign up for free magazine subscriptions pertaining to your topic of interest. Unfortunately, while infinite knowledge surrounds us, most people ignore it. Take for example this comment about education from successful real estate investor Lonnie Scruggs, LonnieCruggs.net. I used to work two jobs. Education changed my life. Before I learned how to put my money to work, I was doing all the work. I was so uneducated back then that I thought the answer to financial freedom was working two jobs. And that's what I did for many years. Finally, I realized there weren't enough hours in a day and I couldn't work enough hours in a month to reach financial security. There had to be a better way. I started looking for that way. When I realized that education and knowledge was the answer, I made up my mind to get an education. Before that, all I had was some schooling. Now I realized I needed some education. Now I can look back and see that I didn't do all the easy and fun things like many people were doing, but I did all the right things. And today, we enjoy financial security and financial freedom. We can do what we want. Many of our friends are still working jobs, searching for financial security that they will never know. They had the same chance to make choices that I had, they just made the wrong choices. They all had schooling but they didn't have the necessary education that provides financial freedom. Now they tell me how lucky we are. The best investment you can make is in yourself. So be willing to pay for your education now, or be prepared to pay a much bigger price for your lack of education later. The choices you make today will determine your financial future. Be sure you make the right choice, because you will have to live with the results of that choice. The rich understand that education doesn't end with a graduation ceremony, it starts. The world is in constant flux, and as it evolves your education must move with it or you will drift to mediocrity. I don't have time. Tailgating the crutch of, I don't know how, is, I don't have time. Where on earth will you find time to change your oil? I mean seriously, between the full-time job and the two kids, where is their time? 
it's in between everything else. Changing your oil isn't difficult when you attach it to existing activities of repetition and consistency. While time might be linear, it can be manipulated by performing double duty on one time block, as in the old cliché, killing two birds with one stone. Maximize time and you maximize wealth. Accomplish two objectives in one time frame. Make life your university. Here are some time cheating. Life University Strategies Driving University Listen to audiobooks or financial news radio while stuck in traffic. Traffic nuisances transformed to education. Exercise University Absorb books, podcasts, and magazines while exercising at the gym. In between sets, on the treadmill, or on the stationary bike, exercise is transformed to education. Waiting University Bring something to read with you when you anticipate a painful wait, airports, doctor's offices, and your state's brutal motor vehicle department. Don't sit there and twiddle your thumbs, learn. Toilet University, never thrown without reading something of educational value. Extend your sit time, even after you finish, with the intent of learning something new, every single day. Toilet University is the best place to change your oil, since it occurs daily and the time expenditure cannot be avoided. This means the return on your time investment is infinite. Toilet time transformed to education. Jobbing university, if you can, read during work downtimes. During my dead job employment, driving limos, pizza delivery, I enjoyed significant wait times between jobs. While I waited for passengers, pizzas, and flower orders, I read. I didn't sit around playing pocket poker, no, I read. If you can exploit dead time during your job, you are getting paid to learn. Dead-end jobs transform to education. TV Time University, can't win yourself off the TV. No problem, put a television near your workspace and simultaneously work your fast lane plan while the TV does its thing. While watching countless reruns of Star Trek, boldly going where no man has gone before, I simultaneously learned how to program websites. In fact, as I write this, I am watching the New Orleans Saints pummel the New England Patriots on Monday Night Football. Gridiron gluttony transformed to work and education. Think about the time you already use. How many hours do you waste in the trivialities of life? This time doesn't need to be lost, wasted time. This time is ripe for fast lane oil changes. To start your oil recharge, Choose a topic that interests you or an area in your life that needs improvement. Not good at sales or writing. Get to the library and start reading. Before I started writing Fastlane, I bought six books relating to publishing, writing, and authoring. I didn't blindly write and publish a book, I educated myself thoroughly during the process. Set a goal to read at least 12 books per year, or one per month. If you are agris, civ like me, you'll read a book every week. I can't stress enough that the more knowledge you consume, the more torque you create on the fast lane road trip. The $50,000 oil change. The last time I went to one of those while you wait oil change places, an advertised $21.99 oil change morphed into a $110 bill because of extra service suggestions. An oil change shouldn't cost more than 25 bucks, and anything heavier should arouse your suspicions. 20 bucks is the average price of a book. Used books are less. Library books are free. Continuing education at a community college is $30 per credit hour. Oil changes are cheap. Yet, we continue to strap the chains of debt to our ankles and pay thousands of dollars for our oil changes. I saw a picture the other day of a student publicly protesting one of the Gov. Earnment financial bailouts. She hoisted a large placard that read, I've got a 4.0 GPA. $90,000 in debt and no job, where's my bailout? Where's your bailout? Let me tell ya, walk into the bathroom, flip on the light switch and look in the freaking mirror. There's your bailout. I'm tired of sob stories from well-intended students who graduate from college with mountains of debt and can't get a job. Take responsibility. You bought into the myth that college ensures a job. The fact is, when you allow market forces to drive your vehicle you're likely to end on the street with a homemade poster proclaiming the value of your 4.0 GPA and the crushing burden of your six-figure debt. No one cares. 
You're in debt because you borrowed. You're in debt because you bought into the lie and relinquished control. You bought the slow lane. Were you forced to take loans? You don't have a job because you voted for the politicians who penalize producers and reward consumers. Face facts. An expensive oil change that forces a lifetime of indentured time is stupid. Again, parasitic debt doesn't care about the source, it only wants to eat your free. Time, preferably seasoned with a little salt and pepper. The Millionaire Fast Lane. The Seminar Fail 193. What idiot would pay $50,000 to attend a seminar? Many do. This is a common question at the Fast Lane Forum. So and so is offering a three day seminar on real estate investment for $50,000. Should I buy it? What? Are you a smoking crack? Do you know what you're buying? Let me tell you. You're paying $50,000 for someone to explain a book that's found at the bookstore for 19 bucks. A $50,000 seminar is exploitation of what we producers know, people are lazy. People want it handed to them. People don't want to read and connect the dots, they want it done for them. People want to be steered. They want someone to drive their vehicle. People want events, not process, and what better event than a $50,000 seminar? Seminars can be great for education, but it has to be the right seminar, which is affordable and given by producers and experienced experts, not by professional, career public speakers. Most high-dollar seminars are well-orchestrated marketing machines tailored to extract every dollar from your wallet. Most cheap seminars are day-long upsells to a more expensive seminar. And those well-suited presenters? They suffer the typical paradox of practice, rich from public speaking to millions but not rich from what they teach. A member of the Fastlane Forum reflected on her recent seminar experience with a popular book guru. First, you won't be allowed to network. If you were allowed to network then people would find out quicker that the seminar is just one giant sales pitch for a larger, more expensive seminar to the tune of $50,000. Second, you won't learn a damn thing, except that you should have listened to your gut and not gone. There really is a sucker born every minute. Amazing how people have nothing in the bank but can come up with $50,000 just for the hope of something better. And finally, there is a segment in the seminar where they have you increase the balance on your credit cards, because after all, the rich make money and the poor earn it. So then everyone goes and increases their balances, and then guess what, they hit you with the purchase price of any, where from $16,000 to $50,000, depending on how serious you are. Ridiculous. Apparently not, because people go rushing to the back of the room like cattle to slaughter, credit cards in hand. They leave with a nervous sense of self, satisfaction and a cute little sticker on their shirt that says, I invest in myself. A $50,000 oil change is as shocking as a $50,000 seminar. Good seminars are under $1,000 and are given by respectable experts, practitioners, and seminar firms. Good seminars are educational and don't come at the price of a new Cadillac Escalade. Bad seminars are hyped, high pressure, and exploitative. Bad seminars are about making money and not about helping you. Part 6, Your Vehicle to Wealth, You How can you tell a good seminar from bad? The first tip-off is price. Anything unreasonable is a warning sign that the provider is more interested in making money than education. The second is price again. Be wary of free. Free usually means 8 minutes of education and 8 hours of upsell to a higher-priced seminar. Thirdly, who is giving it? Is it a professional speaker? Or someone who actually practices what he or she teaches? Read the fine print. Johnny Guru's strategies have made millions, and then the fine print says, Johnny Guru will not be in attendance. Ah. Huh. Would you allow an acting surrogate to perform surgery on you if the real surgeon wasn't available? Fail. Chapter Summary, Fast Lane Distinctions. Fastlaners start their education at graduation, if not before. A fastlaner's education serves to advance their business system and their money tree, not to raise intrinsic value. Fastlaners aren't interested in being a cog in the wheel. They want to be the wheel. I don't know how, is an excuse dismantled by discipline. Infinite knowledge is everywhere and it's free. What's missing is discipline to assimilate it. 
you can become an expert in any discipline not requiring physical skills. Educational recharges can occur within time blocks already allocated for other objectives. Organizers of expensive seminars take advantage of sidewalkers and disenfranchised slow laners by marketing empty promises as events. Fast Lane 28. Hit the red line. If things seem under control, you are just not going fast enough. Mario Andretti. Fast lane winners are forged at the red line. Winners are forged at the red line. What's the red line? The red line is pure, unadulterated commitment. Money trees, businesses, and systems aren't built overnight. It took Chuma years to construct his pyramid machine. Commitment is money tree water, sun, fertilizer, and cultivation. I know commitment is a word likely to cause a riotous exodus. If you think fast lane process is easy, stop now and go back to the slow lane, which isn't easy either. Remember, get rich easy is a lure with a hook. The creation of a vibrant business is like raising a child from birth to adulthood. Like a parent has to commit to their children, you must commit to your system and your business. It is at the red line where the limits of a car are tested, and that is where your limits will be tested. Are you interested or committed? Too many people saunter through life coasting in first gear and then wonder, how did I get here? Who doesn't want to worry about money? Unfortunately, it doesn't take any effort to be interested in wealth and financial security. Interest is kindergarten, it isn't enough, and those who have interest live in first gear. To get out of first gear, you must make a concerted effort and a lineage of good 195 choices to exploit the power of the fast lane. There's a profound difference between interest and commitment. Interest reads a book, commitment applies the book 50 times. Interest wants to start a business, commitment files LLC paperwork. Interest works on your busy, ness an hour a day Monday through Friday, commitment works on your business seven days a week whenever time permits. Interest leases an expensive car, calm, commitment rides a bike and puts the money into your system. Interest is looking rich, commitment is planning to be rich. Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, didn't build the most used social networking site by being interested. He was committed. Thomas Edison didn't invent the light bulb by interest, he was committed. Interest is quitting after the third failure, commitment is continuing after the hundredth. While I was building my company, my system, my surrogate, I was committed. I'd spend 12 hours a day for weeks perfecting and building my system. I'd forego nights drinking with friends. I lived in a cramped studio apartment. I'd eat cheap pasta for lunch and dinner. I was ready to wash dishes to work my plan. While my friends were more concerned with bragging rights for having the fastest car on a racing video game, I wanted financial freedom. I wanted a fast car in reality, not on a video game. My friends were committed to being winners in a fantasy world, while I was committed to being a winner in the real world. Fast lane winners are forged at the red line. Distance yourself from most people. How bad do you want it? How willing are you? Are you willing to sleep in your car for it? Are you willing to live in a tiny apartment while your friends own houses? Are you willing to forego the new BMW in favor of a rust bucket with 150,000 miles? Are you willing to wait tables at Maloney's Bar and Grill when your friends have cushy $50,000 per year jobs? How willing are you? Most people aren't willing, and it separates the winners from the losers. The idea of living in the rat race for 50 years has to be more painful than the idea of working your ass off to escape it. You can have mediocre comfort now or meteoric comfort later. The fast laner trades short-term comforts with the foreknowledge that long-term extraordinary comfort is to be gained. When it comes down to getting in the mud and getting dirty, most people will opt for the smooth sailing of first gear and avoid the discomfort of red line. The red line busts through roadblocks and hardens process. When Carnegie Mellon University professor Randy Posh was diagnosed with terminal cancer, he blessed us with his last lecture. He said. The brick walls are there for a reason. The brick walls are not there to keep us out, the brick walls are there to give us a chance to show how badly we want something. The brick walls are there to stop the people who don't want it badly enough. They are there to stop the other people. The last two words of the quote are, other people. 
You want to be damn sure you aren't other people because other people is synonymous with most people. Most people are consumers who are two paychecks from broke. Most people won't invest long hours into their business system while friends are living it up on credit. Most people will allow friends and family to deflate their dreams with that won't work directives. Most people start excited and gush with exuberance but give up at the first pothole or failure. Most people succumb to I quit and give up not knowing that they are one or two plays away from a touchdown, the fast lane exponential growth curve. Are we there yet? Wealth is a devious entity and its elusiveness weeds out the weak. Your journey will follow a predictable path of excitement, questioning, commitment, and rebirth. Fast lane success requires an investment toll of time and effort. This is the toll that makes you special and keeps everyone else out. This redlined effort cannot be bypassed nor outsourced. Prime your expecta, tie-ins for work and sacrifice, know your destination, envision your dreams, ready your means, and know that you are simply paying the toll because you don't want to trade 5, 4, 2 for life. If you don't do the hard work that fast lane opportunity demands, someone else will. And if you aren't like everyone, you will discover something miraculous, you can live unlike everyone. Get your foot off the brakes. The sweat of success is failure, and I am soaking wet. If you've taken a step, spin, or aerobics class, you know the objectives, to sweat. To get your heart rate up, to build cardiovascular endurance, and to lose weight. If you went to a cardio class and the instructor forbade sweating, it would negate its purpose. Hard work naturally produces sweat, and sweat becomes evidence of your effort. Unfortunately, this ludicrous analogy is the paradox you face if you fear failure and refuse to release the brakes. The sweat of success is failure. While you can't build cardiovascular endurance without sweating, you can't experience success without failure. Failure is simply a natural response to success. If you avoid failure you will also avoid success. You can't drive the road to wealth with the brakes engaged. You have to take risks. You have to get uncomfortable. You have to get out there and fail. What causes this fear of failure? Fear of failure is attributed to an overestimated worst-case consequence analysis. What is the absolute worst that could happen and the probability of it happening? You fail at business and have to go back to work. Big deal. When you resist societal headwinds, you will sweat. Take calculated risks. Do so and things happen. You meet new people. New opportunities arise. Feedback pours in. Lucky breaks converge into your life. The act of doing does marvelous things. Yes, the fast lane is a risk. Failure is imminent. I learned how to code computers by trial and failure. I'd fail a code block hundreds of times before I found the right way to do something. My other failures ranged from moronic multi-level marketing programs to jewelry to direct marketing programs. Each time, I brushed it off, reanalyzed, learned, adjusted, and tried again. The brakes were disengaged, baby. I once heard, a smart man learns from his mistakes. A wise man learns from the mistakes of others. You can learn from my failures. I didn't learn the fast lane overnight. I found it by the light of failure. Fear of failure is normal, yet failure creates experience and experience breeds wisdom. Fast lane risks can have lifelong returns. Bill Gates is a one-hit wonder. He built one company and made billions. One company was all it took. Some might say I'm a one-hit wonder. Great. I'd rather be a one-hit wonder than a no-hit wonder. One hit is all it takes, and you could be set for life. You have a challenge. If you want to hit home runs, you've got to get up to the plate and swing. Home runs or singles can't be hit sitting on your butt in the dugout or sitting on the couch eating pretzels while killing grunts on Halo 3. Get up to the plate and start swinging. Start striking out. After enough swings and acclimating yourself to the velocity of business, contact becomes easier. Take intelligent risks and skip the moronic ones when it comes to risk analysis, there are two types of risk designated by best and worst case outcomes or consequences, intelligent risks and moronic risks. Flying to Las Vegas and gambling a month's salary at the craps table is a moronic risk. Driving a car on the freeway with faulty brakes is a moronic risk. 
When you take intelligent risks and avoid the moronic ones, you amplify your wealth trajectory through time. Intelligent risks have a limited downside, while their upside is unlimited. Moronic risks have a bottomless downside and their upside is limited, or short term. Most moronic risks fall into the asymptomatic category. They simply aren't clearly defined and it takes a little diligence to spot them. When I'm out racing on the streets of Phoenix in an 850 horsepower car, I'm engaged in an asymptomatic, moronic risk. My upside is a short term burst of adrenaline and a temporary ego boost. The downside is crashing and killing myself or someone else. The upside is limited and short, the downside is unlimited and long. Yes, it seems so idiotic. Here's another moronic risk, and it took me this chapter to uncover it. I'm writing this book on a cloud computing application. That means I'm writing to an external source or an external server. I have not made copies of my work. If the cloud server fails, my work is gone. Yes, moronic risks come in all sizes and flavors, and this makes me the idiot of the day. Excuse me while I go back up 199 my work. Okay. I'm back. Now let's talk about intelligent risks. When I invest $100,000 in an internet company, I'm engaging in an intelligent risk. When I sold my internet company, I reinvested part of the proceeds back into the company. I still own a minor poor percentage and it is completely passive. Why did I invest $100,000 and expose myself to the risk? I assessed the acquiring company's probability of success to be high. Their goal was to take my small company and transform it into a $100 million company. If they succeed, my small $100,000 investment would then be worth $2 million. The downside. The company could fail and the liquidation value of my investment would lose about 50%. My downside is limited while the upside is substantial. This is an intelligent risk. If you quit your job to engage in a fast lane business, it's an intelligent risk. Your upside could be millions. The downside. You might have to live below your standards, mop floors, flip burgers, eat rice and beans, and ride your bike to the grocery store. Is that really that bad? Not if you know your destination and your commitment to the roadmap. Again, it all comes down to what you are willing to do and not willing to do. Risk involves careful stewardship of choice. Minimize moronic risk and take advantage of intelligent risk. As for failure, trust me, it is easier to live in regret of failure than in regret of never trying. Smack, someday. What prevents people from hitting the red line? Someday does. Someday I will, someday I'll do this, someday I'll do that, someday when the kids are grown, someday when the debts are paid, someday. And yet, someday never comes. Someday is a distant horizon in the theater of your mind. Someday is dangerous and paralyzing. It traps you in land of nowheresville. Someday is here, now, pristine and clean and begging no allegiance for tomorrow. The fast lane petitions you for this simple transformation, make someday today. Ever drive somewhere and all the traffic lights are green? Unfortunately, when it comes to opportunity and risk minimization, people wait for perfect timing, they wait for all lights to go green, which summons the someday's. Ask anyone seeking slow lane escape, why haven't you made the leap? What are you waiting for? It's always some excuse. I'm waiting for a promotion. I'm waiting for my kids to be older. I'm waiting to be debt free. I'm waiting until I inherit money. I'm waiting for the new year. I'm waiting to finish school. I'm waiting for my wife to get a job. I'm waiting for the economy turnaround. I'm waiting until I fix the hot water heater. I'm waiting for this. I'm waiting for that. The common thread is always the same. I'm waiting. But waiting for what? Someday. Someday for something, some event, or some precondition. Sadly, these mentally constructed provisions come and go, leaving the opportunity seeker stuck in the same rut for years. Waiting for all green lights is waiting for the skies to turn purple on the third Wednesday in November. Let me be clear if I haven't been, there is never a perfect time. Someday is today. Today is now. 
A week is seven days strung together while a year is 365. Today is all you've got. And if you wait, opportunity passes. Your fast lane journey never starts and year after year passes with new preconditions being added while the old ones are satisfied. While opportunity passes, guess what else passes? Time. Ring up the cheesy soap opera music. Yes, as time passes, so do the sands of your life, and these are the days of our lives. Opportunity doesn't care about timing. Opportunity drives through your neighborhood frequently, and when it does, you have to grab that bitch. Evaluate the risk and take action. Unfortunately, opportunity doesn't care about your timing. Opportunity doesn't care about your circumstances, your broken down car, or your life's turmoil. It comes and goes of its own will, has a mind of its own, and it's blind to predicaments. Opportunity comes dressed as changes and challenges. Remember, change makes millionaires. The Fastlane Forum, thefastlaneforum.com, is my example of seizing opportunity outside of my desired timing. My forum existed years before this book was written because opportunity drove through my neighborhood unannounced. My preconceived timing for the Fastlane Forum was after my book's completion. However, years before the first word was written, I revisited a business forum that I had once frequented. I recognized familiar forum contributors lamenting about the old days and how hucksters had invaded the forum, people pimping their spam, schemes, and scams. It was a blooming garden of flowers that had become overrun by weeds. People demanded change or an alternative. In my mind I had a forum coming at some point in the undefined future. But this opportunity was not coming at my convenience. Opportunity suddenly turned the corner and I heard its deafening exhaust. Even though I was in the shower, I got out, ran outside soaking wet, unprepared, premature, and met the opportunity. I greeted it, opened the door, and led it inside. Not in my time, but opportunity's time, and someday became today. That decision allowed me to pre-sell hundreds of books before the first word was written. Many of the world's successful entrepreneurs started businesses in college. You know their companies, Microsoft, Dell, FedEx, and Facebook. Their founders seized opportunity outside of their timing and chose to take an intelligent risk. These entrepreneurs captured opportunity and didn't wait for satisfaction of preconditions, after I graduate, or, on summer break, or, after my Math 202 exam. Opportunities are dressed as unfilled needs, and when they ring your doorbell, answer it. Unanswered, opportunity leaves and rings another doorbell, knowing eventually, someone willing will answer. Why not you? Timing is rarely perfect. Waiting empowers mediocrity. People sit around waiting their entire lives for the perfect this, the perfect that. The perfect scenarios and circumstances never arrive. What does arrive? Time, old age, and the specter of a dream lost. And now you have the opportunity to get out of the garage and take the road. The road is where your fast lane journey starts. Fast lane roads lead to wealth. You have the fast lane roadmap, and you know how the slow lane and the sidewalk operate. You know how to tune your vehicle. You know which mindsets are assets and which are liabilities. You've exposed the gravitational forces that will conspire against your vehicle. You have all the necessary tools to get out of the garage and get on one of the many roads to wealth. Yes, it's time to hit the road. Chapter Summary, Fast Lane Distinctions Interest is first gear. Commitment is the red line. Hard work and commitment separates the winners from the losers. Some choose short-term mediocre comfort over long-term meteoric comfort. To live unlike everyone else, you have to do what everyone else won't. Arm your expectations to hard work, sacrifice, and other bumps in the road. These are the landmines where the weak are removed from the road and sent back to the land of most people. Failure is natural to success. Expect it and learn from it. One home run could set you financially secure for your life, perhaps. Generations. Home runs can't be hit in the dugout. Moronic risks have unlimited downside, long-term, and limited upside, short-term. Intelligent risks have unlimited upside, long-term, and limited downside, short-term. 
There is never perfect timing and waiting for someday just wastes time.